The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Parents and governments agree that $10 a day childcare would be great. A year has passed since Ontario and the feds inked a deal to do just that. Tonight, what have we learned about whether it's actually feasible to create enough spaces at that price? Then, 60 years ago this past weekend, Lester B. Pearson became Canada's 14th Prime Minister. We'll explore his considerable legacy with historian Anthony Anderson. It's Monday, April 24th, and that's all ahead on The Agenda. Ontario was the last province to sign on to the federal government's plan to deliver $10 a day childcare across the country. It hasn't been smooth sailing, but there is some progress and work going on. So, a year on, where do things stand in this province? Joining us now in the nation's capital, Armin Yalnesian, economist and Atkinson Fellow on the Future of Workers. And here in our studio, Jameson Stevie, Chief Strategy Officer for the YMCA of Greater Toronto. Kim Yeaman, past president of the Association of Daycare Operators and the director of Simcoe Child Care Services in Innisfil, Ontario. And Joy Adiola, registered early childhood educator, a member of the Association of Early Childhood Educators of Ontario and a trustee for CUPE Local 2484. And we are delighted to have you three with us here in our studio at Young and Eglinton. Armin, always great to have you on the program. Lovely to see you again. And I'll, let's start with you. How successful, in your judgment, Armin, has the federal child care program been so far? I think it's been an enormous success for three reasons. Uh, first, that it put child care on the map as an economic development uh, foundation uh, for Ontario, for anybody that is trying to get all hands on deck again after the pandemic. Secondly, that it put a premium on attaching conditions to transferring federal dollars. It's kind of the old Roy Romano, we're trying to buy change. And thirdly, that it talked about the need to reduce parent fees, excellent retail politics, but following that up by saying, and more people need to have access to exactly that. And that's where it's stumbling okay. in Ontario and elsewhere. More on those three thoughts as we continue. Kim, how about for you? Uh, well, I'm going to say that um, obviously this has been an incredible experience for parents and, and completely needed. There are different aspects of the program. It was rolled out very, very quickly um, without a lot of consultation of the uh, the stakeholders at, at, because they had to get it out quickly and meaning get it you rolling. Guys, meaning the meaning operators. Us in the, meaning the operators. Okay. Uh, we're seeing that change now, which is fantastic. Uh, and I think we're learning as we go. I think there's going to be a lot of learning to do and that the Ministry of Education is committed to hearing what we have to say and how it is going to work and be able to provide child care to as many parents as need it and want it in this province. Okay. Joy, from the point of view of employees, how's it looking so far? Yeah, so far what we see is that we have more enrollment because um, the parents are coming out to, to to the workplace to bring their children so that they can go to work. So it's a good thing, I presume, There's more a good enrollment. thing, yeah, more enrollment, yeah, and uh, parents are getting more money in their pockets because the government is reimbursing them for the payments they made in the past. So mostly positive as far as you're concerned? Positive in, in terms of uh, for the parents and for the for the children. Uh, how about for you, for the for the people for, who work there? For the people that work there, it's been like hectic for us because uh, low, lower fields, they're not, it's not been matched with uh, wages and salaries. So now we have a uh, high turnover in terms of our supply staff. So because it's not helping the cost of living. So they're not staying. So sometimes people stay for two hours, one day, one week, and they leave. So we get burnt out because the government hasn't looked into wages and salaries. Okay, we will pursue that. That's an important mm -hmm. angle we'll want to pursue as well. Jameson, how about from your point of view? Um, a plus as an idea, uh, mm -hmm. B plus as execution. So I would, I, would, I would agree with Armin. I don't think we've ever heard as much public discourse about childcare as we have in the last 12 months. That's a wonderful thing. I think we're all learning about the business 
of childcare as well as the impact of childcare. We all learned it during COVID, uh, those of us who were home with kids. Um, I think we learned the benefit and value of those people who provide care and education to our kids during the day. So now we're finding out about the execution going forward and that's gonna be the hard work that we're doing with both federal and provincial governments. So, so far, proud of the national infrastructure, but more execution to, to proceed with. All right, let's find out what the issue is. A plus for idea, so obviously you love the idea. B plus is not bad, but obviously could be better. What needs to be better? Yeah, and, and B plus with a trend line, right? I, I think um, it's, it's been tough for operators. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, back and forth on what the funding model is going to be, um, how quickly we are moving towards uh, $10 a day. So in the last year, we had a 50% reduction of the fees. That's wonderful for families. That's wonderful for parents. That's wonderful for kids. As operators, uh, the ins and outs of those checks coming in from parents and then money going back out to parents, that's an operational uh, uh, barrier that we're all having to go through. Um, and then trying to get the clarity from the provincial government about what the funding formula is gonna be going forward. That's where I'd give it a B plus and I would accord with joy. You know, um, if you build it, the people will come. We also need the people to provide the care to the little people who are coming. <laughs> and that's the major part of execution that we need to work on. Armin, let me follow up with you on this issue of childcare as economic development. I know a lot of the rollout has transpired during an international pandemic, so it may be difficult to get a great understanding of sort of long range how this is all going to work out because the circumstances were not ideal in the beginning. But what, what do we know right now in terms of how effective it's been as a, as a lever for economic development? It is ineffective as a lever for economic development if you cannot get the staff to stay. There is money there to train them to do actually early childhood education. Don't forget, human beings from zero to five are sponges. They learn how to learn in this window. They get ready for school and they get ready for life in what they learn in those years. And we want their parents to fully deploy whatever human capital they got in the labor market. And that isn't always providing unpaid care for their kids. That's, um, that's minimizing their potential. And so where we kind of drop the ball on this whole story, make it cheaper for parents, increase enrollment, add spaces, is exactly what Joy was talking about. Do you know that in Ontario right now, the starting wage for a registered ECE who might have sunk between two and four years of their lives to study how to be an ECE and spent somewhere between ten and $30,000 to do so, is paid $19 an hour as a starting wage and that that person could be making the same money working as a pet groomer based on Indeed's uh, job boards. And in fact, I was looking at this up in garbage workers in Ontario get paid $25 to $30 an hour plus benefits. So we pay more to the people that throw our garbage out than the people that are developing our next generation of human beings. It seems to me like a massive oversight in the way the program was developed and funded to begin with, where we talk about the need for better workers to be able to do the basically the hat trick, the hat trick being get more parents to work, uh, increase purchasing power because they're working more, so you're fueling all businesses, and then you're developing the skills of the next generation. That's the hat trick. We're doing number one and number two and not number three. It's just a waste of money. Well, if I didn't know any better, I'd swear that the reason that the people who pick up the garbage are paid more is because they're overwhelmingly male, and the people who do early childhood education work are overwhelmingly female. That's just an observation. I don't know if that's true. But I do have some numbers here. Sheldon, top of page two. Let's bring these numbers up. These are from the Atkinson Center's Early Childhood Education Report, 2020. Admittedly, a few years old, but not out of date, I'm sure. Looking at the workforce across Canada, 96% of early childhood educators are female, 96%. One third are immigrants. Immigrants make up a quarter of the general workforce, so a disproportionately large number are immigrants. One third receive zero health benefits, 41% have no paid personal leave, 44% of registered early childhood educators do not currently work in licensed child care. These numbers are not gonna come as any surprise to you, I know, right? No. You see this every day. Why is it like this? Yeah, the thing is that the government hasn't really looked into uh, early childhood education because it feels more like maybe in the past it was considered as like a babysitting job. Mm -hmm. So, but now we're coming out to say that this is not a babysitting job. This is education. This is the foundation of every child. and. 
whatever we lay on the foundation is very important. Whatever we build, the foundation of every child education is very important. So that's what we're saying. So it has always been considered as a babysitting job. But mm -hmm. now we're saying we went to school for this. We are professionals. We are building the foundation. And the foundation has to be solid for every child. Did you go to school to learn how to do early childhood education? Yeah. Where'd you go? Seneca College. Seneca. For how many years? I went there for two plus years. Two oh, plus? Yeah. How much did you spend? I can't say that for the amount, right? Because <laughs> I wasn't prepared for this, but we spent thousands. Thousands of yeah, dollars. Yeah, out of my pocket. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Was it a good experience? Yeah, it was a good experience. We learned so much, and to realize that when you come to the feed, you're being paid peanuts, like nothing, hmm. it's not. Nice. Okay, it's I got an encouraging. I yeah. got an operator over here, Joy, so I want to ask her about uh, Do you pay peanuts? Kim? We try not to pay peanuts because we know the value of our ECs, but there is limited to li limited funds that we have to pay staff because that money comes directly out of the parents' pockets. So you're, you're always playing this balancing act of, you know, keeping your staff, keeping the culture, providing opportunities for your staff to professionally develop. Um, and but that those those rates are not even close to what they need to be. Yeah. One of one of the real issues here is too is we're looking at a at a different playing field. When you say 44% are not in childcare, 2014 FDK came in. The full day kindergarten. Full day kindergarten. Jameson uh, Stevie's boss brought that. Jameson Stevie's boss. Some guy with the last this. name McGinty. Yeah. <laughs> there he is. Um, and there was a mass exodus of ECEs from the field uh, into the school boards, hmm. and the pay is. There's a huge disparity between pay within the Ministry of Education. We have child care workers that are being paid at least $5 an hour less than people who are doing their job in the school board. So until we level that playing field, until the government levels that playing field on where the pay stands, then people are going to continue to leave the child care field, head to the school boards, head to different, hmm. head to different areas of child development. Um, so that $18 wage floor that was instituted, I, I will tell you, my staff looked at me and everyone I know and everyone we've talked to in the province, that wasn't even close to, it was a big disappointment, unfortunately. Do you have a lot of turnover in staff? Um, Pre-COVID, we did not. Um, there's a lot of other things that you can offer your staff, a culture, uh, support systems that are in place for them in their jobs, resource teachers, things like that. Uh, and now, po uh, post-COVID, now, is a really different story. Lots of turnover. And not just in our, e our ECEs. Our, our assistants are also absolutely vital. Our educators, every one of our educators is, is vital to our program. So, but people are getting burnt out. People, right. are, people are tired of not being seen as professionals. Well, I got some numbers here to suggest mm -hmm. that it's not going to get any better going it's forward. Not, and Jameson, I'll put this to you. Yeah. The Ontario government's crunched the numbers. They show an expectation of the province being short Mm -hmm. 8,500 yeah. early childhood educators within two years, uh, which is when the $10 a day program is expected right. to be fully in effect. And, and why would there, I mean, this is clearly work that a lot of people want to do. Why would there be such a deficit of numbers? So I think it speaks to a couple of issues. One, to build off of what Armin said as well, we've long advocated, and most of us in the system have, for accessible, affordable quality childcare. And we've really focused on accessible and affordable, I would say, over the last year for the first year of implementation. Mm -hmm. But quality is really driven by the people who come to work there. Um, for those of you who've dropped your kids off, when you see staff who've been there for years and years, you just see that as an indicator of quality, their experience, their relationships with the kids. So why? I think one part of it is that, so in TDSB, the Toronto District School Board, as an example, they pay $28 an hour with a wage floor of $18. Municipalities paying around $30. You're in an inflationary time it's just math. Like if you're a graduate, mm -hmm. you're going to choose to go work at a higher rate so you can afford the things that you would like to afford in your life. Mm -hmm. um, we as the YMCA, we pay kind of in the 23 to $25 mm -hmm. range and we also have pensions and benefits. So we're able to attract some, but to that number point, it's a real, the, the, the supply line isn't there and we're increasing demand at the mm -hmm. same time as we're decreasing our ability to raise revenue. That's a significant public policy problem. If you're gonna cap at $10 a day, mm -hmm. I can't generate more revenue as the YMCA to pay my staff. So there's a gap that's building that someone's going to have to fill and we're arguing for the government to start filling that. Where role. are you in capacity right now? So um, to get to pre-COVID, we would need 700 ECEs. 
You need set your 700 short right now? To get to pre-COVID numbers. To get to pre-COVID. So we have 35,000 licensed spaces. Mm-hmm. We have 16,000 kids. That's not because there's no wait lists. That's not because we don't have the physical space. That's because we don't have the staff to fill those spaces. So Even we at 25 have, bucks an hour? That, correct. Mm-hmm. Um, th- th- that's because we're trying to get... The, Every year, the College of ECEs, I think the number is around 5,000 new registrants every year. But there's also people leaving the mm-hmm. field. We believe that with an increase in pensions and benefits across the field, not just for us, and also an increase in salary, you're going to bring some of those people back and you're going to be able to attract some of those people currently working in municipal and or um, school board. Let me ask Armin, if the road forward is obvious, if the solution is obvious, why is it not happening? If higher wages is the way out of this thing, why isn't it happening? I don't know how to answer that politely. (laughs) Well, be impolite. That's okay. Uh, This is a government that is willing to uh, work for workers when the workers are building physical infrastructure, but not for social infrastructure. It's placed a wage cap on public sector workers in healthcare and education Mm -hmm. since prior to to COVID and certainly before a 40-year spike in inflation. Uh, And uh, it's just not... It, it's just kind of going la la la. I can't hear you when it when a woman is saying, "I need to be supported." I want to do some math too because this is one of the few programs you can do math on TV. <laughs> Nineteen dollars an hour is now the wage floor as of January of 2023, only for registered early childhood educators. If you're not registered, if you're in assistance, you get bupkis out of this government. Um, so and you're going to get paid less than that. Uh, Stephen Lecce, our uh, minister responsible, said that that would affect 25% of all workers in the field. In other words, 25% of all workers in the field who had sunk time and money into becoming registered were getting paid less than $19 an hour. Wow, number one. Number two, you are expecting these people... I, I, I just want to speak to Joy for a second. I don't know what it was like when you started, Joy, but when I do the math, I see $19 an hour. I see roughly 22,000 hours a year for full-time, full year. That's $38,000 um, $38, a year. Take off taxes and deductibles. And you have a one-bedroom apartment in Toronto if you're just coming into the field and coming into Toronto. Minimum $2,000 a month. You add to that if you're alone, you don't have any children, no dependents, you've got $3,500 for food costs a year, plus presto, almost $2,000 a year. You're in the hole. You are in the hole for the privilege of doing paid care work for our youngest learners. And then we are expecting people to go through school. There's money for people to go through school, but it's kind of like filling up a pail with holes in it. It's like, yeah, go ahead, pour money into training more people, but they're leaving as soon as they've got the training because of what Kim said, because of what Joy said, because of what Jameson said, which is it is a public service and it should be treated as such. We should be educating down. We've got four and five-year-olds into full-time uh, uh, child care. We should be getting three-year-olds into it. We should be building on what we've got and acknowledging that this is a public service to everyone, to the parents, to the kids, and to the entire economy, and treat people providing this care as if they are providing a public service, not doing you a favor and babysitting your kids, as Joy said. This isn't babysitting. I mean, it could be. Maybe that's what the province is going for, is warehousing your kids so you can get back to work and pay more in taxes. But the way we're designing this, we're just literally leaving money on the table instead of investing in the people that provide the care that develop our children. Why are we doing that? I don't get it. Well, let me play devil's advocate here, because money does solve some problems, but it doesn't solve every problem. Joy, is this just about pay? Yeah, it's not just about pay. It's about uh, the, the decent working condition. Like we need to have decent work, working condition. There are some children that needs like uh, like di- children with differing abilities. They need extra support. We need funding for that. We need pension because if you are uh, working in a place, if you know that you're going to be having a pension, you have in WSIB when you get hot, you having that coverage. 
then you have some kind of peace of mind that you're going to a job that you have uh, stability uh, you can depend on. But if you, you don't have personal days, paid personal, uh, personal days, paid sick days, you're sick, you're still going to work. So it's, it, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a good, uh, it's not about just the dollar value, it's about everything. Hmm. It's about everything. Yeah. Jameson is, I mean, the numbers were very compelling in terms of the differences mm -hmm. between men and women who do this work. It's overwhelmingly female. Do we have a discrimination against women problem in this province and country? Mm. As it I think, that's, to I think that's a different show, oh, that's but a, yes. That's a big I, question. I, 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 so, so I would go back to, so first of all, a couple things. Um, one is, this is incredibly valuable work. Um, I think it's rewarding work for those people who go through it, but it's challenging work. It is physical work and it has changed substantially. Think about how we all have these conversations, dinner table conversations with each other about how our kids have changed during COVID. Mm -hmm. Now we're asking early childhood educators to educate those kids for seven to eight hours a day as if nothing has changed over those three years. So recognizing the conditions in which they're working. Is there female discrimination? Most of, the, most of the careers, and perhaps Armin would agree, that we called heroes of the pandemic mm -hmm. were, women. were women. We're women. And we have forgotten them very quickly, whether they were frontline service providers, whether they were nurses, whether they were ECEs. Mm. So yeah, I, I think there's a problem. And I think also, you know, another tangent of our conversation for ECs is governments seem to be very anxious to talk about expansion and building new spaces. Um, I'm all for renovations. Renovations sound great, but there's there's a hole in the living room that we need to fix first before we build out the, the kitchen. So um, I think we need to, to work on the people who are in the system right now. Otherwise, we can build bright, gleaming boxes. There's no one to provide the care. Kim, what do we need? Um, we need funding for A, for the ECs, for sure. Uh, but we also need funding for the rest of those staff. The rest of those educators are just as important as those ECs. We have a, a, a huge complement of people who are working in the system going and going to school at the same time right now. There's nothing for them. And as Jameson said, there's no way to increase revenue to give those people raises. And the gap continues to become wider. So it's not just about the RECs. Yes, they are trained. We have lots of people in training who are not even being recognized. Um, when, you know, Joy talks about working conditions. Um, you know, our child care centre is open uh, 11 and a half hours a day. So it takes a lot of staff to run that. Um, that not is not necessarily being recognised. Tell us it's, about that. How many kids you got there? So in my zero to five program, mm -hmm. uh, there's a, I have 137 spaces. And in my six to 12 program, I have 80. So we have, a, we have about 250 200. families. Okay. Yeah. And 44 staff. So there's a small compliment that our RECs, and we've actually taken it on to educate our staff within and provide those director approvals, provide education grants to our staff. Um, so providing those education grants is great, but what is their incentive at $19 an hour, as you say? What is their incentive to stay? Um, yes, it does start with money. Supports for children with exceptional needs. The burnout is incredible, and I'm not sure if you're seeing the same thing in the YMCAs, that the increase of children with exceptional needs who need more one-on-one -on -one or smaller group care, we can't provide that because the CCEYA minimum standard... The, sorry, CC what? The CCEYA, so the, 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 that is our governing body. The Ministry of Education uses that document to license every licensed child care in Ontario. Um, so there are minimum standards, and we are seeing those standards being very minimal, minimal, and having to go above them to actually provide proper, quality, accessible care for, for children and their families. So it's taking a lot of staff to do that. And this program, unfortunately, is, is seeing everyone as the same. And there is so much uniqueness in this province with so much different types of childcare, Montessori schools, YMCA programs that they have their own program, uh, forest schools, emergent curriculum. There's all kinds of different things and different ways of doing childcare in this province. And that's not necessarily being recognized by this program. Hmm. Um, and that is part of Montessori teachers are not included in the RACE wage grid um, so recognizing them gets more gets more of them into our pro into the programs Jameson I gotta ask you is it possible we've got a situation here where the math is just not going to work out people want to pay low taxes people don't want to pay too much out of their own pockets for mm. child care 
the people who do child care need more money in the system, maybe the math just isn't going to work out. So I think in our interactions with government, um, I would say they are aware mm -hmm. of the problem. They're becoming uh, more aware of it uh, by the day. Um, and so I think there's a recognition that something's going to need to be done. Whether they have the ability to do it, I'm not sure. Is it just a math problem? No. I think there's some solutions that are possible. Um, you know, currently, uh, the requirements in licensed child care as to who provides care for the school-age children is very similar to what's provided for zero to five. Could you start to ask more requirements for ECEs for the zero to five if that's where you want the largest bang for your buck mm -hmm. is one. Um, new uh, uh, immigrants, new Canadians, um, mm -hmm. recognizing their foreign qualifications. It's been our solution to most economic problems in the history of this country. Um, it, it could probably be uh, useful again here. And I do think, maybe to our means point, um, the challenge that we're going to have right now, Steve, is come September, when parents are starting to register their kids again for childcare. Mm -hmm. And it's the same parents as before who still have access to now affordable childcare, mm -hmm. and there's still going to be a whole bunch of parents on the outside looking in, we're going to start to deal with an equity issue where the family who could afford to get entry when it was 25 bucks an hour is going to, sorry, 25 bucks a day is going to get the benefit of $10 a day. What about all those other families? And that's going to create some political pressure, I hmm. think, that always seems to help math problems. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> Ar yeah. Armin, you laughed there. Why'd you laugh? <laughs> Political pressure always solves math problems. <laughs> always. Do you see it coming this time, though? I mean, the, the, I, I'm not sure that, well, if you look at the polls, you know for a fact that there's a, a, a gender split on, on this government's support at, at the province of Ontario right now. They are much more overwhelmingly supported by men than by women. And rightly or wrongly, probably wrongly, uh, the child care issue is still seen overwhelmingly as an issue of more interest to women than in men. Is that a political problem that uh, seems a little too much to overcome at the moment? I don't know how to read that. I can't read politics at all anymore. Uh, hmm. I, I'm an economist. I'm not a politician. I don't understand why things are as polarized as they are when we had... Talk about snatching defeat out of the jaws of victory. We really had it. Like, we had it made uh, when we signed these bilateral agreements, and things have just kind of fallen in the toilet ever since. So I'm not quite sure that it is solvable, but it isn't because of a terrible math. It's because of a terrible politics. And the polarization between men and women, between younger and older workers, as, as you said, Steve, between people that don't want to pay taxes and don't want big governments, and the fact that everything about the demographic bind we're in right now requires bigger governments. It just requires us to help us more. Because governments aren't them, they're us. It's how we pool our resources to help one another to get the best out of what we have can offer. And I'm, I'm not as hopeful as I was just a few years ago that we see the wisdom in that. Uh, there was a time when I thought, oh, we're going to do this. We're actually going to grow up together. Mm -hmm. But I think my own age group, the boomers, are going to actually screw it over for most people. <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, I still, uh, Jameson, I still hear this, and I'm sure you heard it when you were working in Premier McGinty's office as well, which is, why do I want my taxes to go up to pay to take care of your kids? That attitude's out there. What do we do about that? Yeah, but it, well, I think that attitude is out there for most social goods. Why, why should my tax dollars go to pay for the thing that I don't use? I, mm -hmm. I, but I do think um, large problems require collective solutions. And I still think mm -hmm. there's an attitude. You know, we started COVID with that language, we're all on this together, and we ended it, you're on your own. <laughs> um, and I, and I, do think, I do think there is a social spirit and a public spirit still that exists. Maybe I'm naive, maybe I'm still hopeful, mm -hmm. I mean, um, that that can still rally the day. And so I do think there will be a desire to um, help educate those kids, because they're, they're not just your kids, they're our kids. Um, and I would also say two things in response. One is, one of the models that they used for this was the $10 a day child care in Quebec. Yep. Um, um, one of the ra part of the rationale was female labor force participation. So I would battle your math with, with even better math. If you want people to go to work, particularly women, then someone needs to look after the youngest of us all. And so childcare can be an economic driver in that sense. That would be another number that could help convince others to help pay for it. And I'll take off my hat as YMCA and policy wonk. I'm a dad. Um, let's not lump all men uh, into <laughs> into one bucket. Uh, I'm here with the author of, of She Session, right? Like, and, and 
but I, as a dad at home watching my kids during school, I understand the value of, of childcare. So I do think there will be some, some men who could jump on board uh, with, with an agenda that is talking about the care economy, whether it be childcare, nursing, or otherwise. Gotcha. Joy, why do you do this work? Yeah, I do this work because uh, it's something I love to do. Um, because I went to, I did uh, the assistant program before. So immediately, I, almost immediately when I came to Canada, so I went to the school and somebody said, oh, join this class, it's a very good class. I said, oh no, I'll, let me do something else because before I came to Canada, I was an accountant. Where was so, that? In Nigeria. Nigeria is where you're yeah. from originally, okay. Yeah, so when I came, I said, I just want to do something that will make me just blend with the Canadian society, just getting the Canadian society to be able to afford something, an accommodation or living before I get into the big society. Then somebody said, do this program, the teacher is good. And when I get in the class, I found that the childcare program was very good. Like, he talks so much about the little ones and how they get educated from when they're very small. I'm like, oh, this is an interesting program. <laughs> so I went into the class. I did this class almost a year. And after I finished, I got a job. It was the same teacher that recommended me for the job. So I didn't even ask, how much will I be getting? I was so excited to work with the kids. <laughs> <laughs> I jumped into the class. I said, oh, the children are really learning, the development and everything that we were taught in class. I could actually see it, see everything. So, and when he got to, when I would get my pay, my director just called me, it's time for you to get your pay. I went there and she just gave me $10 per hour. I'm like, what is this? She said, that's what you get. <laughs> 10 bucks an hour. $10 per hour. How $10 long ago per was that? Hour. That was in 2014, April 2014. So almost a decade ago, yeah. 10 bucks an hour. Yeah, so I said, oh, is this what you get? Yeah, that's what you get. So I, I realized I didn't have anything other than $10 per hour. No, no pension, no pay sick days, no nothing, paid uh, professional development, nothing. So, okay, then Joy, why do you still do this work? <laughs> so why I did it was that, I felt like if I go to college to get more uh, tools and education, then I'll be able to work, continue to work with the kids and I'll be in a better place. So, but when I went to the school, I got those tools. Coming back is still like a struggle to get a decent wage. Even though I loved working with the kids, but it's a struggle to get a decent wage. Do you think you will stay in this field? Uh, that's why I'm out here today to fight for the field mm -hmm. because I believe that it's something we can achieve. Mm -hmm. Because if we come out to speak to speak in the media, we come out to speak and people hear us and they know what we're doing, I believe that they would appreciate us and give us what we deserve. Don't you find children annoying and whiny and why do you <laughs> want to spend any time with them? Uh, <laughs> I would say working with kids uh, is an amazing experience. Like, it's, uh, adults are, so do have their own uh, <laughs> ways to... Working with kids is very rewarding because you get to see how they develop. You see from... Because I work with the infants at, at the moment, so mm. I, see, I, I get to witness their milestone from where they, they start crawling, sitting and standing, walking. I get to witness all their milestones, and I get to help them with their language, their social development, their physical, their cognitive. So it's so rewarding to see that, that you're actually achieving something with the kids. So, but when it comes to the wages and salary, that's where we really want mm. the government to... to in, to actually do something. Okay. Yeah. Kim, when she says the government needs to do something, you know, we've got two governments involved in this, right? Yes, we've we got, do. We've got a federal government that mm -hmm. sort of laid it all out and a provincial government that has to implement it. Mm -hmm. Where do you point the responsibility at in terms of who has to solve this? It's both places. Um, the federal government certainly put a lot of constraints on that agreement, and obviously Ontario did fight. The provincial government did fight to get um, the best deal that they possibly could. They were the last ones and, to and sign up. They were up the last ones to Ontario. sign. They were waiting for that. Um, <clears> I had <throat> lots of conversations with uh, Mr. Lecce, actually, um, about that deal and about what that looked like. You know, there's the province, unfortunately, and the Ministry of Education has some very tight constraints put on by the federal government. So I, I think it's it's twofold. I think it, I think it's both levels. Um, you going to sign up next year? Am I going to sign up next year? Well, we're in it right now. 
Uh, we're still working through lots and lots of bugs, uh, mm -hmm. the funding formulas and, and how that funding is flowing and where it's going to. Um, 2024, in the last couple of weeks, we received a discussion paper from the Ministry of Education. We're really, really happy that they have sent that out to every single childcare in the Seawell program for feedback. Uh, about what that's going to look like. So we're moving from a revenue replacement model to a cost to a cost model. Uh, so the model is extremely different. It's it's a complete 180 on what we're doing right now. So it still remains to be seen. Is it going to work? Um, and I'm hoping that with that stakeholder input, that's what we're hoping for, that the stakeholder input is really going to shine a light on how we need to look at childcare as unique. Mm. Parents know what their, children's, what, what their children need, what their families need, and they need to be able to have access, affordable childcare that meets their needs. Everyone is so different. So am I going to sign up for 2024? We continue to work with the government. We continue to work uh, with those regulations and see where that comes from. I will tell you that every single childcare that I have spoken to in this province um, is 100% committed to giving these rebates to their parents. I, I cannot say to you, anybody, yeah. no, my, my parents don't need this. They don't want it. And every single childcare, that's, that's where commitment comes from. It's a labor of love for all of these child cares, no matter who you are, wherever you are in the sector. Um, and we are committed to making it work, but we need to make it work. So that's, so. The word has keep, gone we, forth. We, we, we keep moving <laughs> forward. We need to keep working together. We need to keep pushing forward. I'm going to push forward by thanking Armin Yelnesian, who's there in the nation's capital for us and is always such a great guest on this program. Armin, thanks so much for joining us again. And to our friends here in the studio, Kim Yeaman and Jameson Stevie and Joy Adiola. Thank Joy, you. love your attitude on this stuff. <laughs> Thank <Great>. you. <laughs> Thank Wish you so much, Steve. Wish my kids could have had you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, Steve. Not that there was anything wrong with the... Anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> I put my foot in my mouth again. There we go. Anyway, thanks, everybody, for coming on TVO tonight. It was great. Thank you so much. Thank you. So much. Thank you. for having us. Sixty years ago this month, Canadians elected a government that came in with very low expectations. The government was led by Lester Pearson, whose tenure as Liberal leader began with the worst thrashing in history at the time at the hands of the Conservatives and John Diefenbaker in 1958. Pearson lost the ensuing election as well and sure looked like he'd be unable to parlay his time as a Nobel Prize winning foreign minister into becoming prime minister. But... Pearson won on his third attempt and ushered in five years of some of Canada's most impactful administration ever. And that's how you get an airport in Canada's biggest city named after you. Anthony Anderson is a senior fellow at the Bill Graham Center for Contemporary International History. He's also the author of The Diplomat, Lester Pearson and the Suez Crisis, and he joins us now for more. Anthony, it's good to see you again. Good to be here. Thanks for coming in. Let's go back to the time before Pearson was Prime Minister. He's Canada's, as they then called it, mm. External Affairs Minister, right. basically mm. the Foreign Minister, and he wins the Nobel Prize. For what? Pearson wins the prize because he was able to solve the Suez Crisis. That's when England, France, and Israel invaded Egypt. Pearson went to the UN and convinced the General Assembly to create the world's first peacekeeping force. It goes to Egypt, separates everyone, creates the peace. And uh, he wins the prize, and the most important thing about that afterwards is that it hands him the liberal leadership on a platter. There'd been other contenders, but once Pearson gets the prize, he sort of anointed the golden boy, and he becomes liberal leader in January 58. First ballot over Paul First Martin ballot. Sr. Yeah. One and only ballot. No contest. Yeah. <clears throat> everyone called him, I mean, his name's Lester, but everyone <clears throat> called him Mike. Yeah. Why'd they call him Mike? As the story goes, and I'm not sure I entirely believe it, um, when he was a young guy signing up for the Royal Flying Corps, his commanding officer looked at him and went, Lester, that's no name for a fighter pilot. I'm going to call you Mike. Again, I'm not sure I entirely believe it, but the story sticks and the nickname stuck, and that's how we remember him. He's Mike. always been Mike Pearson yeah. since then. Okay, Prime Minister Louis Saint Laurent loses the 57 election mm. for the Liberals. Lester Pearson wins the leadership in a landslide over Paul Martin Sr. Two months later, John Diefenbaker takes him to the woodshed in that 58 <laughs> election. 208 yeah. seats for the Tories, biggest majority government in Canadian history at the time. Yeah. Why was he such a bust the first time out of the gate? Pearson was not in his element. He was a diplomat. He was... Uh, 
trained to be polite to opponents, trained to have disagreements off, off screen, backstage. In politics, you're meant to shred your opponent. You're meant to criticize everything they do. He was, he was not a natural in that element. And he had the bad luck to be up against probably the greatest campaigner of the 20th century. I mean, Diefenbaker was electrifying. He roused the nation. And like you said, he got the, the largest majority in our history still today in terms of share of votes, share of seats. Brian Mulroney will quibble a bit. Brian Mulroney won more seats more in 84, seats, right. but not a greater percentage. Pearson loses the next election as well in 1962, but he brings Stephen Baker down a peg mm -hmm. to a minority government. Yeah. So give us a sense of what happened in those four years to make things problematic for Deef. Deefen Baker is the author of his own misfortune, maybe like all of us, um, to be fair to Deef. I mean, he has good government for quite a while. He does good things. He brings the first woman into cabinet, the first indigenous person into the Senate. He extends the vote to uh, indigenous people. So a lot of good things and his Bill of Rights. But uh, he begins to govern. He begins to make decisions. And as soon as you do that, you irritate people. So he cancels the Avro Arrow. Um, and he goes after the governor of the Bank of Canada, James Coyne, and he makes it personal. Um, so by the time you get around to 62, um, Deef is looking weak, wounded, uh, bitter, and I think half his cabinet don't trust him anymore. In fact, they threatened to throw him out, didn't yeah, they? There was a yeah. mutiny at some point. So that takes us to 63. That 62 government didn't last very long. 63, Pearson finally makes the breakthrough. But even then, only with a minority government, and even then, he had a 20-point lead in the campaign, and he almost blew it. He only won by eight points on Election Day yeah. 60 years ago this month. What happened? How did he almost blow it? Again, it's Pearson outside his natural element, and things that didn't matter in diplomacy begin to matter in politics, so that we noticed, oh, he's got a lisp, he's got a thin voice, he doesn't project, he doesn't have a commanding presence. He used to wear a bow tie, and his guy said, lose the bow tie. You know, he used to, his thumbs used to stick out, and he would sort of give you sermons like, you know, the son of a Methodist minister he was. Um, he won the popular vote in 63, mm -hmm. and he got, I think, 41 percent. That should have given him a majority, but the luck of the draw, he ended up with a minority. So again, Pearson, you know, barely got over the finish line, but he did. He <clears> comes <throat> in in 63 promising what he calls 60 days of decision. Yeah. What does that refer to? Big mistake tactically. Um, Diefenbaker had looked like a very dithering, mismanaged, uh, incompetent administrators, the Liberals thought, hey, let's de promise decision making. They thought of 100 days, and Pearson said, no, this refers to Napoleon's 100-day march to Waterloo. And they said, you know, Mr. Pearson, no one knows that. Pearson was a history teacher, and he said, well, I can't say 100 days, I'll say 60. And that caused him no end of grief. Isn't that funny? <clears throat> he, he did resolve the nuclear missile issue, right? This was, was a big issue during Deef's time mm. about whether or not Canada would accept Beaumark missiles yeah. on Canadian soil. How did he resolve that whole thing? He waffled a bit. I think Canadians were very split. I mean, we didn't want nuclear weapons. We knew we needed them against the Soviets. Pearson reflected that ambivalence. Diefenbaker reflected that ambivalence. Neither of them really had a clear answer. Pearson, in the end, said um, Diefenbaker had accepted the missiles without warheads. Pearson said, we'll take the warheads, but is there another role for us? So he kind of kicked the can down the road. April of 63, he wins his election. November of 63, anybody who's of a certain age is going to remember this. Pearson was the prime minister when President John F. Kennedy was assassinated, and here is how he reacted back in November of 63. Sheldon, please. The Parliament of Canada was hushed this afternoon. The voice of party controversy was silenced. As I performed as Prime Minister, the hard duty of announcing the sad news of the death of the President of the United States. A death so sudden and so shocking that it left us, as I'm sure it left you, stunned and unbelieving. Kennedy had a famously awful relationship with yeah. John Diefenbaker. What was his relationship like with Mike Pearson? They really liked each other. Pearson had the Nobel Prize. Kennedy came up to Ottawa at some point in Diefenbaker's tenure. There was a party at uh, 24 Sussex. Pearson was there. Kennedy spent all his time focused on Pearson. Hmm. And Diefenbaker never forgot that. <laughs> so they got along. And Pearson was a huge baseball fan, as was Kennedy. So We used to have something in this country called the Pearson Cup, yeah. which was the championship unofficial. When the Blue Jays played the Expos, whoever won that series won the person Pearson right. Cup. Yeah. No more Expos, no um, more Pearson yeah. Cup. Anyway, yes, he was a huge baseball fan.
Let's talk social programs. Tommy mm. Douglas, of course, is known as the father of Medicare because when he was Premier of Saskatchewan, he brought it in for that province. Yeah. But Pearson made it a national program. Yeah. How did that happen? It was more of an intra-liberal party fight. I mean, the party had pr promised something like it since 1919. Pearson, in opposition, I think made a real effort to say, whatever I say in opposition, I'm going to try and do in government. They promised it in opposition. And uh, he announced it to the provinces who were kind of horrified that they would be picking up this huge tab. The Fed said, we'll pay 50-50. And uh, there was a delay, a one-year delay, because um, they wanted to bring it in for uh, centennial year. And it was a huge, part, uh, huge fight within the party. And Pearson uh, looked, I guess, bad because he was delaying, but he was trying to be fiscally prudent as well. In the end, he listened to the progressive wing of the party and uh, enacted it. The Premier of Ontario at the time, a guy mm. named John Robarts, called Pearson's Medicare plan a Machiavellian scheme <laughs> because I think he foresaw a day yeah. when it wouldn't be a 50-50 cost-shared right. program. Yeah. And that's what we've got today. It's more like 75-25 yeah. yeah. today. I say give it to the feds. <laughs> Lose the provinces. <laughs> All right. He brought in the Canada Pension Plan as well. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? And often these things have nothing to do with the actual policy. It's interesting, like Pearson wanted to bring in a pension plan. To do that, he had to talk to the provinces. Quebec wanted its own pension plan. And instead of really talking about the details, they got into this huge fight over jurisdiction. Quebec wanted to, um, the pension fund to build up funds so that they could rebuild schools, highways, all of that kind of thing. Uh, Pearson had a very simple plan. In the end, he basically adopted the Quebec plan. And I think this was, this was real genius on his part. He um, didn't get stuck in positions. And when he recognized Quebec had a better plan that would, would build up social capital, he um, let go. And it was a part of his brilliance in diplomacy, don't get stuck in losing positions. Hmm. Made him look weak in politics, unfortunately. Okay, <clears throat> so we've talked about Medicare. We've talked about the pension plan. These are things that have survived to this mm. day because of the Lester Pearson government. This may be the biggest one of all, though. Sheldon, you want to bring this up? Okay, that's what our flag used to look like. That was called the Red Ensign. And obviously, with the Union Jack in the top left corner, it very much signified our ties to Great Britain. <clears throat> Pearson wanted something more uniquely Canadian. And that's what we got. <laughs> How did all that happen? Nearly cost him his government. Um, Pearson had spent his life as a diplomat serving under the Red Ensign. So whenever he showed up at a... UN gathering, NATO, the Red Ensign would be there and people would say, sorry, are you the British or the Canadians? No, we're the Canadians. So against the advice of many of his advisors, because they just scraped through the pension plan battles, like by the skin of their teeth, they'd had their first moment of calm and Pearson went, now's the moment. So against all the advice, he launched it. A maple leaf didn't look like that at the beginning. There were two blue bars, there were three maple leaves. He took that into the House of Commons, and Diefenbaker, who was a staunch Red Ensign man, a staunch monarchist, erupted. And it was probably one of the most vicious parliamentary battles we've seen. The Tories said, we, we fought in World War yeah. I and II yeah. under that flag. Yeah. It was yeah. good enough then. Why yeah. isn't it good enough today? Yeah, I mean, I respect that. I remember interviewing Eric Nielsen, a former cabinet minister for Mulroney, who said that. He said, you know, I watched my comrades getting buried beneath the Red Ensign. So it was heartfelt, and I, you know, with all respect to Diefenbaker and those guys um, and all the love they had for the Red Ensign, Pearson had a different idea of Canada. I think he had a different sense of where we were heading. Bilingualism made mm. its first significant strides under Lester Pearson, and here's what he had to say about that 50 years ago in an interview with Larry Zolf. Mm. Sheldon, if you would. Bilingualism, I think, is essential in this country in the sense that where a knowledge of two languages is necessary, in areas where both languages are spoken, in the national capital, which is the capital of a bilingual country, in occupations like diplomacy, where French is really a very important language, in those occupations, in those situations, both languages must be understood and learned. Just before I get to bilingualism, I mean, there you go, right? <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. the bow tie, the yeah. squeaky voice, yeah. the lisp. Yeah. How'd that guy ever become successful in he, politics? He couldn't do it today. He could <laughs> not do it. No, it's quite true. Okay, Pierre Trudeau was really thought of as mm -hmm. being the prime minister who really made great strides when it came to official bilingualism mm -hmm. in Canada. But Pearson moved the ball down the field. Yeah. How did he do it? I think he, did a, I think he really did a lot of the hard work. He uh, made a very uh, significant speech in Parliament where he essentially said, to I'm sure Trudeau's horror, Quebec is not a province like the others. 
It is a nation unto itself. We need to recognize the difference, re almost recognize it as a distinct society. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was, I think, what I, I like so much about Pearson is that he has um, this incredible sense of generosity and a real sense of inclusion. Quebec was a second, or I should say, Francophones were second class citizens in those days. They didn't sit on boards. They didn't sit in the highest posts of government. Um, it's hard to believe now, but they really were second class. And Pearson wanted a confederation of equals. So he launched the Royal Commission on Bilingualism, which Diefenbaker hated, thought it would tear the country apart. Pearson took the risk. And I think underlying all of that was his sen the sense that he was asking all of us to imagine a much different country. Hmm. When 1967 came along, mm. Canada celebrated its centennial. I think people may remember our 150th birthday celebration mm. a few years ago, and it was very muted, yeah. I think is the way to say yeah. it. What was it like in 67? It was a glorious celebration. I was mm. too young to remember it, but from everything I've seen, like we were feeling confident, cocky. It was a lucky place to be, this country. Hmm. Just as Jean Chrétien was asked by George W. Bush to support the American war effort mm. in Iraq, Chrétien declined. President Lyndon Johnson asked Lester Pearson for Canada's support for the war in Vietnam. Pearson declined. In fact, he went to Temple University in Philadelphia and he urged the United States to stop bombing. How did LBJ react to that? It is one of the great stories in Canadian foreign policy. Um, Lyndon Johnson was a cantankerous, bumptious guy, uh, huge temper tantrums. Pearson made a bit of a diplomatic faux pas. He did not warn the Americans in advance because he knew they would shoot it down. So he said the speech, think about a pause in the bombing. Um, he goes to Camp David. They're supposed to have a lunch. Johnson is picking at his food, not looking at Pearson, taking phone calls. And Pearson knows a storm is coming. And then he said something like, what did you think of my speech? Pearson asked Johnson. Johnson and Johnson erupts, pulls him out to the, the porch that apparently wraps around Camp David. and. Our, um, our uh, ambassador in Washington, Charles Ritchie, is looking through the window and can see screaming, Johnson waving his hands. In one version of the story, he grabs Pearson by the lapel and says, you can't come here and piss on my rug. <laughs> and Johnson, to be fair, was right to be irritated that something like this was said in his backyard without warning. It was a rare faux pas for Pearson, but I think he was also trying to tell Johnson that if you go too far, it's gonna be a quagmire you won't get out of for a long time. One of the things that made Pearson's <clears throat> government and cabinet unique is that he had mm -hmm. a lot of future prime ministers in that cabinet. Yeah. Let's bring up this shot here. This is one of the most famous shots yeah. in Canadian political history. That's Pierre Trudeau on the left, John Turner beside him, Mike Pearson in the middle, and Jean Chrétien to the right. You've got four prime ministers, present and future, in that one shot. He seemed to put his thumb on the scale mm. for Trudeau when it came time for him to leave and a successor to be crowned. Why did he do that? He really wanted a francophone successor. His first choice was Jean Marchand, who was the labor minister and the guy who actually pulled Trudeau into cabinet. Trudeau wasn't a star when he came. He was sort of a nobody, um, in the, in, in sort of nationally but he quickly emerged as the justice minister. And Pearson, I don't know if he did anything directly for Trudeau, but he let it be known informally that he was the guy. Well, he brought him into cabinet as justice minister pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. And set up national tours for his justice minister to go out and have constitutional negotiations with the premiers and so on. Yeah, people were bitter about that. Yeah. Like Paul Hellier, the John Turner minister. was too. <laughs> both, pretty, yeah. both pretty bitter about yeah. it. But it, 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 was, it certainly was an attempt by Pearson to favor Trudeau. To f yeah, I mean, he wanted a francophone successor, and, he's, and Pearson said that he would be the last unilingual prime minister. And I guess I think he, he was. Everyone, yeah. yeah, you cannot become prime minister, and that is that's part of his legacy. Mm -hmm. Well, here we are, 60 years later, mm. after his first becoming prime minister of Canada. He's the guy they named the airport after. Yeah. How should we remember him? I think it's the great innovator, the great catalyst. Uh, he left behind a very different Canada than the one he inherited. You know, Diefenbaker was a very, in a way, unilingual, Anglophone, British-centric Canada. Pearson pointed towards the future. And I think he left behind a much more inclusive, generous Canada. He only served five years as yeah. prime minister. Yeah. Actually, not even. Five years Fairly. minus a few yeah. days. Yeah. How come? 
he, could, he knew he couldn't win another election. He didn't want to fight another election. He'd fought so many. He was also 70 at that point. I think he was feeling mm -hmm. quite burnt out. And when you look at what he'd done, what else was there to do? I mean, he'd left behind such an incredible legacy. Pierre Trudeau tended to get a lot of the credit for it. But Pearson really put into place the Canada that I took for granted for a very long time. Can you imagine if Pearson were around today, he left at 70, there's an 80-year-old yeah. president of the United yeah. States today? Kind of makes you reevaluate how old is too old to be a first yeah. leader these days. I mean, I think he was, I think he was tired. He'd been through some bruising elections and he'd watched Louis Saint Laurent stay on way too long, so mm -hmm. I don't think he wanted to repeat that mistake. Where's he buried? He's buried in a lovely country cemetery um, just outside the town of Wakefield in the Gatineau Hills. In Quebec? In Quebec. Does anybody know why? Because he's from here. He's from Toronto originally. Yeah, he had, he's buried next to two friends, two old friends from external affairs. And at some point in the 1940s, they found that spot and decided the three of them would be buried together. Sweet. Yeah. If he were alive today, I mean, you've written this book about him. Mm. You certainly studied as much as anybody in this country. You've studied his career. You must have at some point thought to yourself, if I ever had the chance to interview this guy, <laughs> here's what I'd want to know. What would you want to know? What would you ask him? Not a great question. I dreamed about him when I was writing the book. And there's always that horrible thing, and I'm sure you must have felt it writing your books. You're just chasing the memoirs, chasing the archives, chasing the bits of paper. He was, uh, he was a diplomat to the end. I don't know how much he would have revealed. I would like to have known more about his fight with Johnson on that porch hmm. after the speech, his dealings with Mackenzie King. I mean, he started in the age of Queen Victoria, and he died in the age of Aquarius. So there's so much history there. And, uh, and, yeah, he didn't reveal all he knew. Ain't it the truth. 60 years ago this month, Lester Pearson became our Prime Minister, and Anthony Anderson has been our guest. He of the Bill Graham Center for Contemporary International History, and if you want to read a good book about Pearson's time as Foreign Minister, The Diplomat, Lester Pearson and the Suez Crisis. Anthony, thanks a lot for coming. Thanks, in. Steve. And that is the agenda for Monday, April 24th, 2023. Happy 87th birthday, incidentally, to Toronto's former tiny perfect mayor, David Crombie. And speaking of mayors, several municipalities elected brand new mayors last fall. Tomorrow, we talk to some of them about their first six months as your worship. I'm Steve Pagan. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow.